The computer I'm restoring today has a lot of sentimental meaning to me. It's not the actual computer I once owned, but the same kind of computer that served its purpose well at the time. Today, I'll be restoring this Apple IIc in as much detail as possible, paying attention to even the smallest pieces. To see how I do this, stay tuned. I'm pretty excited about receiving this package because I know what's arrived is a blast from my past. I picked it up off of eBay and in the photos it looked like it was in pretty good condition but I'll have to do some testing to see what works and what needs to be repaired. The first thing I should do is examine the entire system taking notes of any defects that need work. Because I want to restore this computer to be as clean as possible even things like rusty screws may be replaced, possibly with stainless. This examination process will be very detailed and time consuming, so if you don't want to watch the nerdy details of this segment, use the arrow keys to skip to the end where I'll have a 15 second clip of my final notes from this examination. So these are my final notes on the examination of my Apple IIc. I'll have to reorganize them in Google Keep in the order that I'll work on the parts. Right now I have multiple projects going on and I'm limited on workspace. What I'm going to do is work on the IIc from the bottom up starting with the lower shell and working my way up through the parts that sit on one another. I don't have the space right now to spread everything out and assemble them all at once so this approach should work well for me. Before I get started, I wanted to show you the grime that's built up over the years on the motherboard and lower shell. I'm not sure what that is, but it seemed to cause a lot of rust to form on the power supply. I'm hoping an alcohol washing can take this off. With everything removed from the shell of the 2C, I'll first try soap and water to see what that'll wash off before resorting to alcohol. One thing that worried me as I removed the shielding from this lower shell was the sight of a couple of bugs running around in all that grime. I sprayed them with insecticide and hopefully that'll prevent an infestation of something that's not native to where I live. The soap wash did take away most of the grime and made the lower shell look a lot better than when I started. There were still some smudges I wanted to eliminate so I went ahead with the alcohol wash to see if that would make a difference. After both washings, there were still some unwanted marks remaining. If you noticed during the washing, I tried to protect this serial number sticker since it is unique to this computer. The remaining scuff marks aren't too unsightly, but if possible, I want to get the case looking near new condition. So, I think I'm going to do more research on how else I can tackle this. So, after doing some research online, I found mention of using WD-40 to remove the scuff marks. I remember seeing the wonders of WD-40 on YouTube, so I gave it a try and it did work. I feel it's not so much that the WD-40 is doing the work as much as it's helping lubricate the surface my fingernail is scraping scuff marks from. I did check if my guitar picks would be a good substitute for my fingernail, but the difference was night and day. 
where I had scraped for a short while with the guitar pick using my fingernail produced almost instant results. Another blemish I wanted to eliminate was a hole on the rear bottom of the shell. It was something minor, but it seemed noticeable enough that I felt I really needed to get rid of it. So I shaved off the protruding plastic to flatten it level with the rest of the shell. I then cleaned out the inside of the hole for good measure. I can't show it right now, but I'm probably going to fill it with white fingernail polish so it won't be so noticeable. So here's the difference of the before and after at this particular spot inside the shell where the scuff marks were most obvious. You can still see scrape marks left behind, but I'm not too worried about those because they're actually pretty tough to see from more than a foot away. This photo is taken from about 8 inches away from the surface. And finally, this is what the entire inside of the shell looks like before and after. Even though it's the inside where no one will see, I feel it's kind of like those guys who restore cars. They'll clean and refinish every nook and cranny even if it's underneath the car. That's exactly the kind of passion I have for restoring this Apple IIc. The last thing I wanted to try on this shell was the de-yellowing process called Retrobrite. Based on what I saw on the YouTube channel, The 8-Bit Guy, he more or less used these items to accomplish this task. Hopefully I don't mess up the process, but if anything, it's the lower shell and not the top. Before retrobriting the lower shell, I covered the serial number sticker with tape, but this didn't help at all and it's a good thing the sticker is very chemical resistant and durable. Here's a time lapse of what I did to whiten my 2C shell. Because it wasn't that yellow to begin with, I only left it in the sun for about 2 hours. The method I used to retrobrite the lower shell was to fill a bin with water, then mix in the salon developer. This is the creamy version, so I had to mix it around to break down the chunks that formed in the water, but it breaks down pretty easily. In hindsight, it'd probably be easier to mix in the developer before dunking the parts in the mixture. After a while, the chunks seemed to break down on their own as the mixture became hazy. In watching this, I kind of felt the hazy water helped with the process as it seemed to diffuse the light evenly around the shell. One guidance I followed from the 8-bit guy was to turn the item every 30 minutes to make sure all sides get an equivalent amount of sunlight. Because I live in an apartment building, there's not many places I can do something like this. So I hung out in the back of my van watching episodes of the 8-bit guy while I waited for the 30-minute alarms to go off. Here's the results of my Retrobrite on the lower shell. You can see a slight difference in the top and bottom, which is what I wanted. I didn't want to do too much de-yellowing as I do remember the 2C being lighter in color than a 2E, which is what we had in college, but it wasn't white, so I think this is about right. As I worked on the lower shell, I realized something I'm going to need right away are the fasteners for reassembling the parts as I complete their restoration. In the hard plastic container on the left are all the screws and bolts removed when I dismantled the 2C. As mentioned in the title of this video, I'm restoring everything down to the nuts and bolts, so I went out and purchased the stainless steel versions on the right, which will be used during reassembly. A small problem I had looking for replacement fasteners was that hardware stores tend to carry limited sizes. Finding the right diameter of a fastener wasn't a problem, but the right length for a couple of them did not exist at multiple stores. What I plan to do is trim the fastener to length as needed. Next is this paper shield that has rust stains all over it. The stains are probably from the shield it's supposed to be permanently attached to, but over the years it's separated. If I knew what kind of paper this was, I'd buy another sheet and use this as a template to cut out a new one. It's interesting because this is something like parchment paper, but it's not thin. It's really thick like a thin sheet of cardboard. Also, I dunked it under a running faucet because it seemed like it might have some water resistant properties, and it did. I'm not sure how that would help its purpose as a shield, but it's good to know. So since it repels water, what I'm going to do now is see if I can clean off the rust stains with alcohol. The alcohol helped some, but not as much as I had hoped for. 
It looks like I'm going to be doing some research online to find out more about this paper and maybe purchase a sheet to make a new shield. In researching parchment paper online, I did find some information on it that made sense as to why it's used as part of a shield. Also, I'm not sure what would be shielded from heat, if it's the plastic shell or thin sheet metal, of which both could warp, but I'm not exactly sure. I researched pricing on DIYing a shield, but in the end, I found an online store selling the specific shield I needed for my 2C, for what seemed like a reasonable price, even including shipping. I went ahead and ordered it. I'm sure the DIY work required to find the materials I needed and fabricate the parts would have cost a lot more than the online price I just paid. I can now check both of those off my list and move on to the motherboard. In examining the motherboard, there's patches of grime here and there. It looks like the same kind of black oily grime that was on the lower shell. I'm not sure what it is, but it's almost like oil of some kind dripped onto the computer and was left to sit while it accumulated dust over the years. I don't see any obvious damage to the motherboard, so I'm going to start off by scrubbing down the motherboard using alcohol. This should clean it up enough so I can see if there's any damage the grime was covering up. Since I was in the process of cleaning everything, I figured I'd reseat all the socketed chips as a preventive maintenance step. It's easy enough to do if you have a chip puller. I don't have a really good one, but I think this one I have will do well enough. One thing I wanted to do is fire up the motherboard to see what happens. When powering up though, there weren't any lights or noises coming from anything. In testing the terminals of the power adapter, I found it wasn't putting out any voltage at all. The voltage should be something around 15 volts, but I was getting zero no matter which positive or negative terminals I tested. I won't show the details of how I fixed the power adapter, but I watched this video from the Wheelman 282, which is linked in the description. It gave me some really good guidance on dismantling the power adapter, which would have been the toughest thing to figure out had I not seen someone else do it first. Big thanks to the Wheelman 282 for paving the way. Even though I did want to restore the original Apple Power Adapter, I also purchased a more modern one for testing purposes. I've already tested the Power Adapter to confirm it's working, so now with the major accessories connected, I'll try a Power On test. Something that caught my eye as another item of restoration were the rear ports on the 2C. If I can remove each of the metal plates fronting each port, I can probably clean them up to like new condition. So that's what I'll work on next. Some of the ports came apart more easily than others. The two DIN ports with the metal face plates were soldered onto the motherboard, so I'll work on those without removing them since their outer surface is flat and should be easy to work on. The external drive port is giving me a hard time, so if I can remove it, I'll work on it. I'm using a wire brush and 400 grit wet dry sandpaper to clean up the ports and this time I will polish it just to see how it turns out. It's bare metal so I think over time the shine of polished bare metal will fade, but I'll do it as an experiment just to see if there's ways to prevent the tarnishing. Here's the polished port shrouds. I was not able to do the DIN connector ports and the drive port is not as shiny as the other D connector ports because I was never able to remove it from the motherboard. Otherwise, I like the results of polishing them, so now I'll need to see how long that shine will last. I received shipment of the replacement shield and I was a little annoyed it wasn't in better condition. The paper shield seems to be in decent condition with only a small amount of rust stains here and there. Something I guess I can live with unless I can find a way to remove the stains. The part I had hoped would be in better condition was the metal shield. It is in far better shape than the original one I received, but rust is rust. There's a lot less of it on the replacement shield, but I still want it all removed. I originally wanted to use citric acid to remove the rust from the shield, but since it wasn't easy to find at stores near where I live, I decided to go with vinegar instead. 
Where citric acid is usually mixed with water, vinegar is poured into the tub with nothing else. I'm not sure how long I need to leave it soaking, so I'm just going to monitor it every 2 or 3 hours. I'm thinking it may need days instead of hours to allow the vinegar to work, but I'll see how things look in 12 hours and go from there. I ended up leaving the shield to soak for 24 hours, scraping the rust off with a razor. I couldn't tell what helped more, the razor or the vinegar, but the end result were the black patches I had expected. With the rust removed, I now have to get the entire shield to have an even shine across its surface. What I'm going to try is polishing the shield, first with different sandpaper grits. Since the shield is already smooth, I'll start with 400 grit and work my way up through the different wet dry sandpapers, using it to remove the dark patches. I've completed one side of the sanding and here I can show you the difference. The first side is basically what I started out with, where you can see the dark patches where the rush used to be. Then on the other side is what it now looks like after only going over the shield with 400 grit sandpaper. I still have more sanding on this side with the finer sandpapers, after which I still need to polish the shield. I was pretty burnt out after sanding with 400 grit paper for quite some time. I decided to skip the rest of the sanding and go straight to polishing to see how that will turn out even without the fine sanding. I'm using a polishing compound I got from Walmart for a plexiglass project that turned out pretty nice. If I can get that same kind of shine from this shield, I'm thinking this shield will look like it's chrome plated. So after lots of sanding, then polishing, here's the refinished shield. It's not the chrome plated look I was hoping for, but it's substantially cleaner looking than its original condition. You won't be able to see any of this once the computer is reassembled, but this was a personal effort not just to remove the rust, but to also get the shield looking better than new. I don't know what a brand new shield would have looked like, but I think I've restored it to better than new condition. At this point, it's time to start assembly of the lower portion of my 2C. For now, that'll be the lower shell, the metal and paper shield, and the motherboard. One of the new pieces I get to start using are the stainless steel screws that replace the original slightly rusted steel ones. I almost held off on the assembly portion I'm doing right now, because as I looked at the parts and thought back to when I was in college, I remembered the reason I got this computer back in the 80s was to build as portable a computer system as possible. When you look at the 2C, it looks like a laptop from the 90s. Of course, this was still the 80s, but I was always a forward thinking kind of person. At the time, I had the drive, but I didn't have the skill to do something like this. Nowadays, I have better skills and I still love to tinker, but I think one thing I have now that I didn't have back then is access to information on how to do it. I eventually decided I should hold off on that idea and reassemble the 2C to its stock configuration, but memories of my college days have gotten me motivated to do what I couldn't do back then. So, I'll most likely be making a part 2 video to continue my 2C restoration. It won't be anything to turn the 2C computer into some other brand of computer, like trying to build a V8 Vega. This will be a cosmetic and external accessories add-on. That should be a simpler project than this one, so it should come out immediately after, if not soon after this one is released. Next, I'll be working on this internal power supply. It looks enclosed really well, so I think for this part, I'm going to go with the if it ain't broke rule and skip opening it up to examine the internals. All I'll do is shine up the casing similar to how I did the shield. Since this power supply can't be opened up unless I break the spot welds holding the case together, I'm going to avoid wet sanding as a means to remove the rust. If water gets inside the power supply, I won't know where it's gotten into or whether all the parts inside are completely dry. I think the dry sanding should be fine. If you've noticed, I skipped the chemical soak, not only for the same reasons as wet sanding, but also because if I have to end up sanding the rust as well, I really don't need to remove the rust using chemicals. I decided to do the cover and also the top and bottom overlap on the sides of the power supply, since that's the only parts that were rusted. 
Only after I started sanding the cover did I realize the side of the power supply case is aluminum. I avoided sanding the bottom of the case because I didn't want metal dust getting into the power supply through these two holes. Other than the aluminum and bottom, most of the other parts of the case were sanded with 400, then 600 grit sandpaper. As I start the polishing, I want to mention that the polish you saw me using earlier in the green container was the wrong type for polishing metal. I did find the correct one at Walmart, and if you are familiar with metal polish, you know it has a distinctive smell. When I opened this container of polish, I knew right away I bought the correct one. I'm going to polish the overhanging sides of the top and bottom first. These areas are small, not as strenuous to polish by hand, and creates less of a mess because so little polish is needed. Once I'm done with the overhanging sides, I'll tape the sides off to protect them from the splash of the polish while I polish the top cover using the polishing disc. Because the polishing disc is spinning at such a high RPM, it causes small splats of polish to fly in every direction as well as run down the sides of whatever you're polishing. Taping the sides of the power supply should prevent additional cleaning and polishing when I'm done. Here is the polished power supply. Like the shield, it has a nice shine and gives off a pretty good reflection. This power supply is usually the limit of the size of things I don't mind polishing. I usually try to avoid things with large surface areas like the shield, although the shield was an exception for this project. Mounting this power supply is so easy. A PCB slot and two screws and you're done. Everything's looking really nice so far. The feeling I get is similar to like when I used to watch people build custom cars. As I watch the pieces come together, a little at a time, I'd always think it's amazing how beautiful a rolling hunk of metal can become, even when it's only half completed. The keyboard is next. I originally planned to retrobrite the keys for this project. I also mentioned earlier about starting a future project on customizing this 2C into what I had originally wanted back in my college days, which also involved customizing the keyboard. Between the two projects, I have a conflict with work to be done on the keyboard. So instead, I'm going to skip the retrobrite step in this video and only do cleaning and as needed maintenance. I'm going to wash the keyboard with the keys on so it'll be easier to scrub all the keys at once. I tried using alcohol to do this, but it wasn't working so well, so I'm now using Dawn dishwashing soap. Once I'm sure all the keys are clean, I can remove them then clean the rest of the keyboard. I made this keycap remover using a salad fork by removing the center prong. I like this method better than some of the ones where you pull the keycap straight up. I feel like I have more control of removing each key and can feel the keys as they are about to disconnect from the switch. With the keycaps removed, I can now clean the rest of the keyboard. I initially thought there was rust on the metal cover below the keycaps, but I guess it was just grime. With enough scrubbing, it washed right off. I'll have to leave everything out to dry for a day or two, since water inside the key switches are going to take a while to dry. I tried spraying the entire keyboard with alcohol, so it'll displace the water and dry faster, but I'm not sure if alcohol was able to get into the key switches. Something else I did to help with drying, that's after air drying for a couple of days, I also put the keyboard in the oven at a low temperature for 2 hours. At this temperature, the keyboard can still be handled straight out of the oven, so the heat shouldn't damage it in any way. There's a missing key that seemed to break off when I removed it with my DIY keycap remover, but after inspection, I noticed the key was previously glued to the broken half still in the switch. I want to see if I can fix this key somehow, so I'll leave it off for now and move ahead with reassembly. Before I reattach the keyboard to the computer, I need to reconnect the speaker that sits under it. The speaker is slightly bent around the edges from when I removed it during the teardown process. I'm not sure if it still works, but I'll reattach it and see how things go when I test the reassembled computer. If anything is wrong, I can always replace it when I do the customization video for this 2C, which is my next video following this one. It'll be nice to start the customization video off with a newly restored 2C. The last major piece is the floppy drive. 
In the test power-up without a floppy, the drive did make the expected seek noises, so I'm hoping that was a good sign of what to expect. I did see some grime on the drive similar to what was on the motherboard, shell, and keyboard, so I'm going to dismantle the drive as much as is reasonably safe for my skill level and clean off as much of the grime as I can. I'm thinking this drive will have a lot of small parts, so I'm resorting to my stacked containers and labels to keep track of the small pieces I remove. I've always thought of floppy drives as one of the more sensitive pieces of computer equipment, so I hope I don't mess this one up since it did sound like it was initially working. I don't think I can go any further because what's left looks a little beyond my skills for reconstructing this drive if I do try to dismantle any more parts. I see grime that needs removing, but another thing I'm worried about is how alcohol affects the drive belts. I'll have to do some research on that before cleaning this portion of the floppy drive. For the drive, I want to stick with using alcohol for the cleaning since it dries quickly and won't leave any residue. I actually didn't realize it was okay to use soap and water to clean computer parts until I'd seen so many other YouTubers demonstrating it. Still, the fact that this is a drive I probably can't fix for most of the things that can go wrong with it, I'm positive I won't be using soap and water here. After some research, I did find it's not good to get alcohol on the rubber belts. Also, when I attempted to use alcohol to clean the grime off the metal surface, it cleaned off very little at a time. It looks like the grime on the metal causes corrosion, and at the same time the corrosion gives the grime a better surface to stick to. So, it's hard to scrub the grime off, even with alcohol. I eventually decided to use the dry brush with no liquid to scrub the surface of the drive. I was kinda leery about using alcohol anyway, so this worked fine for me. It took some time to scrub through the grime without help of any liquid, but I still got a good amount of it off. Cleaning the bottom of the drive around the belt without alcohol was definitely less stressful. The biggest problem here was that some of the grime had gotten tucked away in some hard to get to places between parts, but I did what I could. I've reassembled the drive and mounting it back in the 2C is pretty straightforward since there's not many places it'll mount to. Just line up the mounting holes and screw the drive in place, then reconnect the ribbon cable. There's a small amount of grime I'll clean out of the upper shell before retro riding it. There's a thin fabric on the underside of the upper shell that may also be parchment paper like the one used for the shield, but a thinner version of it. I'll start with Dawn dishwashing soap and see how that works, especially with getting the grime out of the parchment paper. If needed, I can resort to alcohol. Even though my next project to customize the 2C will completely hide anything I do to the shell in this project, for the sake of this project, I'm still going to retrobrite the shell, just to test out some new equipment I picked up based on an episode from the 8-bit guy where he demonstrated a new technique using UV lights. I bought similar looking lights from Amazon and I'm curious to see how well they work. Another thing I'm testing here is the use of recycled hydrogen peroxide. This was the mixture I saved from when I did the lower shell about a month ago and will now use the leftovers on the upper shell. I've never heard anyone mention whether reusing hydrogen peroxide works, but if it does, this could be useful information. After tweaking the setup to get as much light to shine on the parts as possible, I ended up with this aluminum foil wrapped enclosure. This should be about as good as it'll get as far as lighting the parts. One other thing I realized once I had the lights turned on was that these lights get really hot. You can't see it here, but I have a fan running off to the side blowing air up through the bottom of the enclosure and hopefully helping to cool the lights. I definitely can't leave this setup running while I sleep through the night, so I'll leave the lights on till bedtime, then continue in the morning. I'm going to see how things look at the 24 hour mark by comparing the upper shell and the lower shell. If recycled hydrogen peroxide still works, 24 hours with this kind of lighting should produce pretty good results. Here's a before shot of the upper and lower halves of the shell before soaking the upper shell that's on the left. 
Then here's both halves after soaking the upper shell. It almost looks exactly the same in the before and the after. So looks like recycled hydrogen peroxide doesn't work. I'm prepping to retrobrite using a fresh batch this time. I think this time if the whitening doesn't look substantial after 24 hours, I'll leave it in for another 24 hours. The proportion I used for this mix was 6 to 1. I had 3 full gallons of water but about half a gallon left of hydrogen peroxide which I emptied into the tub. One other experiment I tried since I had the resources and time was to see what happens if I snip a section off of the grime and rust covered paper shield and put that in the retrobrite mix. What you're looking at is 5 hours of soaking in the recycled retrobrite. It may look the same but it did eliminate a lot of the spots from the grime similar to what you saw on the original paper shield. I'm going to continue testing this piece for 24 hours in the new mixture of Retrobrite and see if that works. If it does, it's a way to also restore the paper shield which I wouldn't have thought there'd be any way of restoring. This is a second look at the test paper shield that was initially covered with rust, then after 5 hours had a dark spot, and now this is what it looks like. Using fresh Retrobrite mix had a good effect and the color looks pretty good. There's a small spot of rust in the corner but otherwise it's what I would call good as new. If you compare it side by side with what it originally looked like here where I cut it out from, there's a big difference before and after. This should be it for retrobriting. The color just about matches the bottom. It's nice using UV lights as opposed to depending on the sun, but there are some things I'd do different next time. One of them is to use clear hydrogen peroxide from the salon, not the creamy white one. The white one fogs up the water too much and causes the process to take a really long time. I'll experiment more with this in the future. It's an interesting process that can be useful, but I need to fine tune it a little. Before I can put the shell on, I want to clean up the handle. I don't think it needs to be retrobrited, but mostly just cleaned of some minor marks on the surface. Soap and water and some scrubbing should do it for this part. Once I'm done with this handle, I should be able to put the 2C back together. I'll close everything up, again using the new stainless steel screws. To give you a preview of what I plan to do for the customization video without giving anything away, here are some small tidbits of info. Also, some of these are ideas but not set in stone so even if I mention it now, it may not make it to the final version of development. The number one item I've always wanted to add was portable video. With technology the way we have it now, I have an idea that I'm not sure will work but I'm going to try. I'd also like to run the 2C on batteries. I've seen one YouTuber do this. If I find his channel again, I'll add it to the description of the customization video. I've been dwelling on a new color scheme, but that's still up in the air right now. To fix the broken number 3 key, I have to fix two problems. Under the key, the stem has broken off. Then inside the switch stem, that's where the broken key stem is that has to be removed. To remove the internals of the key switch, I tried using a razor, but I found I needed something thicker and two-sided to spread both sides of the key switch out so I could wiggle out the internal section. Also, remember which way the parts come out, because I noticed the black case I pulled out only fits back facing one direction. Here are those small pieces that were sitting inside the switch when I pulled out the internal section. The first thing I want to do is get the key switch back to what it looks like normally. To start, I'm cutting off the remnants of the key stem that's sticking out of the switch stem. This should also remove as much glue as possible to make removing the key stem easier. I then got a safety pin and poked at the key stem from the underside of the switch stem in an attempt to push the key stem out. It took a while, but I eventually got it out. The trick that worked was to take the internal section that I removed earlier and put the switch stem inside of it upside down. I could then use the safety pin as a center punch and hammer the key stem out. I tested the number 4 key in the number 3 switch and it fits like normal. So I'll reassemble the switch. 
Again, remember the black internal case goes in one direction with the imprinted circle facing the bottom right of the keyboard. Finally, I need to add a new stem to this key so it can be inserted into the standard key switch. I kind of have multiple approaches in my head on how to do this, but I'll see if my top choice works. I don't have the luxury of a 3D printer or tools to work with plastics easily. What I do have though is a bunch of woodworking tools. With that, I decided to make the key stem out of a hardwood like maple. I had thought about using a dowel, but the wood for dowels is extremely soft and may wear out prematurely. I'll get the piece of maple into the basic shape I need it to be in. One side has to fit under the hollowed out keycap, the other side has to fit inside the switch stem. Along with that, there's also some height and centering details to pay attention to. For myself, I have a table saw that I'm doing most of the cutting on. Some of you may have other tools. Because this piece is so small, a handsaw would probably work as well. I think even a hacksaw could get this done. Here's a quick rundown of what I did to cut out the key stem from the wood stock. I first trimmed it down close to the size I needed the stem to be. I used the keycap to get a rough estimate of how wide to make the stem. If anything, I made it slightly wider knowing I could always sand it down to size. Now that I have the basic size close enough, I can cut it off from the wood stock and work on getting it cut down to a better fit. This is the piece cut from the stock from which I'll start removing wood more accurately till it fits inside both the switch and the keycap. Here's a test fit of the almost completed wood stem. It fits in the switch pretty snug. I only need to cut the flat top to fit under the plastic keycap. It fits in the switch by friction as opposed to how a normal keycap kind of snaps into place, but it seems to hold okay. I can also remove it if needed using a key puller like the one I made using the salad fork. The initial size I cut the stem to was slightly loose, but after building it up with Elmer's glue, it fits just right. Buying a new keycap is not that expensive, especially since I already fixed the switch and all it needs is the key. So, attempting to DIY the key stem has more to do with testing myself to see if I can do it and nothing to do with saving money. One thing I have to say, it's projects like these that make me think about getting a 3D printer. I'm certain by the time I'm done, I'll have an even better appreciation for 3D printing. So this is my completed keycap with custom wooden stem. It's glued together and dried already. All I need to do is press fit it into the switch and I'm done. Here's my refurbished 2C connected to the composite port of my 2019 LG LED television. I'll boot it up and see if I can get the boot screen on the TV. So upon booting, I do get to a boot screen. I've tried all the discs that I have and either none of them are boot discs or something's wrong with the floppy drive. I'll have to investigate how to troubleshoot that. Another problem I found was the keyboard isn't fully functional. Multiple keys are not working, for example, the E, the O, the 0, and some other keys, so that's another thing I'll have to troubleshoot. I've seen many people with 2C computers with bad keyboards. Even though the keyboards don't seem fragile in hand, I guess they must be in some way. So I have refurbished this computer with some new parts, some revitalized parts, and some custom parts. I was hoping everything would be working right off but I'll try my hands at troubleshooting the floppy drive and keyboard and see how that goes. As I find out what's wrong and fix them, I'll leave updates and links in the description. By the time you see this video, I'll most likely be done with the repairs. Maybe this video can persuade you to track down that old school computer that got you through college. Refurbishing old computers can be a risk because replacement parts are so hard to come by. Comparing that to fixing an old car, it's similar where if the part you need no longer exists, you have to improvise. But good luck if you do give it a try. Leave your questions and comments in the comment section below. That's all I have for now and I'll catch you in the next video.